Good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing today? Did you guys take a peek over in the fellowship hall? We have a baby shower after service. Ladies, please come on over to the uh, baby shower after service. Did everyone get a listening guide? If you did not, just raise your hand and we'll get one to you. If you guys look at the back of your listening guide, you'll see all the upcoming activities. If you're a volunteer in Kidstown or Kidstown Junior, we're going to have a meeting in March. And if you're a new uh, visitor um, to CCF, we have a special lunch for you to get to know the staff, the elders, the pastor, and more about CCF, who we are, what we believe. We'd love for you to come. Uh, to the lunch with us. So just take a look at the back of your bulletin. Welcome back, Seth. We missed you guys. Did you have a great vacation? Good. Well, you know what? Well, we're here. It's Sunday, and we're here to praise the Lord. So let's all stand and worship. stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard a tender whisper of love, the dead of night, and you tell that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're good, good father.
thank you, Father, so much. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. And Lord, as Nate brings the message today, I pray that you would help us to remember all of the ways that you have moved in our life. We know the things that other people say about you, Lord, but we also know all of the things that you have done in our life, the evidence that you have shown us of your presence, of the gift of your son, Jesus, and how he moves through our lives, everything that has been washed away because of the stone that was rolled away from the grave of your son, Jesus, and how he is alive in us now, Lord, when we put our faith in him. It is that evidence of your work in our lives, Lord, that we can share with other people. Help us to remember those things and the ways that you have moved in our lives as we continue to take the gospel and the message of salvation from your son, Jesus, into the world. And Lord, we ask that your spirit would rest on us as we do those things. Help us to, to not worry about the words, Lord, but it, it would be your words placed in us through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Look around you. There's so much work to do. This world is in no condition for us to simply sit back and watch. There is a tangible, desperate need for Jesus. A glimpse of hope in the midst of hopelessness. Jesus experienced this. He saw it firsthand. The need broke his heart and filled him with compassion. He turned to his disciples and said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. This alone should stir our hearts. It's a calling, a calling to make a difference, to share the truth of the gospel, to be a light in the darkness, to be the church. It's time for us to look beyond ourselves, to turn our focus to the field, to answer the call and passionately share the love of Jesus. This is our mandate. This is our mission. Are you ready to do the work? Good morning, church. Oh, you're alive today. That's wonderful. I'm, a, I'm, I'm still recovering from my coffee. I'm a, I may or may not have gone just a tad bit over this morning, so I am what they call over-caffeinated. Um, what a great message, right? What a great mini-movie. Um, as I was selecting movies or looking for something to kind of connect the dots on this series that we've entitled Gather, Grow, and Go, and one of the uh, desires that I had was to, to take uh, and capture what this means to, to move as a church, what this means to, to grow uh, in, in, our, in our likeness, and then to go and do what God has called us to do. And so what I'd like to do this morning is I'd like for us to bow our heads. I'd like to go ahead and pray. And I don't want to waste any of your time. I want to dig right into God's Word and see what God's Word has to say. So bow your heads, won't you? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for this opportunity to be able to speak to your people. And Lord, I just pray not just for this church, Community Christian Fellowship, but for all the churches, the church Catholic around the world, Lord, that they are uh, doing your will. And so, Father, for the pastors that are in the pulpits and the, the teachers and the lectern, that as they open the scriptures, your word that you have given to us, that it be tr for transformation uh, into your likeness, Lord, that, that your words, when they go out, they not return void, but they go out for what they were intended to change lives. And so, Father, we we're going to take that message out today, and, and as we dig into the Scriptures, as we dig into your words, particularly this passage today, I pray, Lord, that you have already softened our hearts and you have softened our ears to receive your word so that we may go do what you have called us to do. And I lift this service up to you and this church up to you and your people up to you, Father, and it's in your Son's precious name, the name of Jesus Christ, I pray, and through the power of your Spirit, amen. 
It all started with television, a one-way communication channel that excessively turned into sensationalism back in the early 1990s. You see, major broadcasting companies realized that reports on murders and violence improved ratings, so naturally they flooded TV shows and news with crime-related stories. And however, the process had significant side effects as some people decided to take drastic measures and turn off the news channels for good. And the same thing happened with online media, such as, well, we all know the major media corporations out there, where users that hide or remove friends who continuously burden their followers with violence-contaminated content. News consumption is not just a mental process. On the contrary, it has affected our bodies as well as our minds, so it is it's critical to keep taking doses of quality information on a regular basis. And in that way, you can create a balance between the two opposites and improve our overall health condition. When we're bombarded with bad news, it increases the level of cortisol in our, in our bodies, primarily stress hormones. And while naturally regulating body pressure and many other processes, cortisol can cause some severe side effects and cause us to feel stress. However, in 2016, The Guardian launched a pilot project aimed at to explore the reactions of the readers when a positive news was presented. The results were staggering. Not, not only did the, the upbeat stories earn thousands of followers, but the positive stories were shared throughout their social media accounts. And the conclusion, what, the, what they came from this, was that people were and still are eager to hear good news. And I want to welcome you to the Community Christian Fellowship. If you're new joining us, we want to welcome you. We've been in a series that I have entitled Gather, Grow, and Go. And our focus has not been just to, to look at the mission statement, not just to see what the Bible says about these three words, but to actually evaluate our church and see if we're actually applying God's word correctly. And last week I made the argument that if we're going to grow effectively, that, uh, that, that we're to make every effort to be found spotless and to be, to be found blameless and to be found at peace with the Lord before His second return. But what's more, that, that message came with a warning, if you can recall, that, that we're to be mindful how we grow. Remember, how are we taking this information? People that are in these pulpits and lecterns that are, that are expositing the text, are they trained people? Be careful how you grow with false teachers that there are false teachers today that seek to twist the Word of God. And finally, we closed with our charge, church, to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, my closing argument last week was that the one thing, it's one thing to know the Bible, the Word of God, to open it and read it. It's another thing entirely to know the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm going to start with a question. You should be used to this. What do you tend to share more of? Good news or bad news? I want you to think about that for just a moment. Think about your conversations that you have on a daily basis, whether at work or in the home or even at church. Is it categorized as good news or bad news? When's the last time you received a, a really good piece of news? Do you remember what that made you feel like when you received that? What kind of emotions came with that? The title of this message is The Going of the Saints. We're going to be in the book of Matthew, so if you have your Bibles or your iPads or your phones, please pull them out. It's the first book in the New Testament, Matthew 28, and we're going to be studying uh, verses 16 to 20, which is the Great Commission. And in the text, we'll have the opportunity to see uh, what can help, our, help us in our doubts as we seek to live out this calling to, to live out the gospel. Next, we'll have a chance to observe what Jesus gives in, 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 in all of his authority to rule over creation. How does that possible? How does that, how does that happen? What is the driver? What makes that possible? And then last, we'll close with our homiletical proposition. For those of you new, fancy word again, just means what do I do with the text? How do we take what the original authors intended, right? How do we interpret that? I'm teaching you how to read the Bible, people, when we do this, okay? How do we interpret that? How do we pull that forward 2,000 years? And how do we apply it in 2022? It's 2022, right? Not 21, right? Okay. Just checking. So as you're turning there, let me give you a little bit of background. Let me give a little bit of context in the book of Ma uh, in Matthew. The book of Matthew, I want you to pay very, very close attention to this, okay? The book of Matthew records selected events from the life and ministry of Jesus Christ in order to confirm to a Jewish audience that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, the King and to explain the kingdom program of God for the present age in light of Israel's rejection of her king. 
It's a mouthful. Let that soak in for a second. What else do we know? Well, being one of the, the three of the subnoctic Gospels, it's nearly impossible to date the book. However, some evangelical scholars put its writing around 37 to 38 A.D., uh, and as the, the first book of the New Testament, Matthew captures what no other gospel account does, that the revealing of the kingdom was for, was for both Jew and for Gentile. And that increasing amount of nature in which Jesus reveals himself suggests that despite the miracles in clear view of the Jews, despite the miracles that took place for the Jews, it was the Gentiles church, the outsiders, not the ones that were the insiders, yet the outsiders that understood who Jesus really was the Messiah. And where we drop into the text today is at the very end of the book of Matthew, beyond, beyond the empty tomb, right, uh, and the personal experiences of the resurrection, past the official explanation, and we're going to land on the official commissioning of the disciples. So if you have your body, Bibles, you're ready, here we go. Main point one, knowing the Lord will help with our doubts. The Bible says in verse 16 that 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Most of you in here are familiar with the Great Commission passage. I'm certain there are a few of you in here that could probably just quote it verse by verse, just by heart. But, but what I want for us to seek in today is, is these questions that we need to start to ask in order for us to understand. We must, as lifetime students of the Scriptures, church, those who are seeking to grow in their grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, we must start to ask important questions. For starters, how did we arrive here? Why are there only 11 instead of 12 disciples? Why did they go to Galilee? But most important, most important in these questions, why did some doubt Jesus after his resurrection? You see, church, it's in these kinds of questions we ought to be asking ourselves as we open the Word of God and begin to, to search for clues. We begin to, to seek an understanding. You see, that's, that's when we approach God's words diligently and we ask the Spirit to illuminate the text as we start to read God's Word like it's a love letter. That's what my argument was last week. When we open Scripture, read it. Some of those who have been commissioned overseas, when you had correspondence from your spouse, you read and hung on every single word. That's how we should be searching the Scriptures in order to gain understanding, but also helping the, asking the Spirit to help us illuminate that for us. In order for us to answer these questions, I want, us to, I want us to backtrack a bit, okay? I want you to look with me. This is what it says in Matthew 28, verses 1 to 10. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for the angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him, they shook and became like dead men. Verse 5 says, the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He's not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Verse 7 says, then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. Here's your clue. There you should see him. Now I have told you, so that women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, uh, yet filled with joy. And ran to the disciples. Verse 9 says, Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, cl clasped his feet, and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There's your second clue. There they will see me. In the closing of the book of Matthew, in the 28th chapter, we know that Jesus has already, has already risen. We know that he's had a conversation, he's appeared to, to 500 people. Uh, just like he said he would. But what's interesting is, is when you consider the Apostle John's account. Uh, Matthew didn't record the meeting of Jesus with the ten disciples later, the same day like he did in, in John 20, 19 to 23, or the appearance eight days later uh, to the 11 uh, uh, disciples in John 20, 24 to 29. But what Matthew did do, what Matthew did record is that sometime later, in Galilee, he promised to meet up with them on a mountain in Matthew 26, 32. Look at the text again. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Listen, the scriptures are not clear so far. They're just not clear as to what mountain they met. But what I'd like us to focus on is not that so much. I want us to focus on the doubt part, the doubt aspect of this. Doubted what? What are they doubting? 
Folks, Jesus has already appeared to them earlier and verified that it was him. But the text says that they doubted, but, but doubted what? It wasn't the resurrection, okay? They didn't doubt the resurrection. They actually struggled with if this was actually Jesus himself. Listen, there, there are probably some doubts that people standing before him that was this actually the risen Lord? Did he actually do what he said he was going to do? And I mean, you know, how you, you can spend day in and day out with people, with someone watching them die and, 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 and then has a conversation What's most likely the case is that they were simply weren't prepared to stand in the presence of a supernatural manifestation, an exalted holy being. I mean, think about what this would do to your system. In any case, some of them were among the were, were experiencing a shock to the system. And, and, and just think about what that's like. To we we don't see this normally. We don't see where where someone that you have a conversation with. Could you imagine them say, "I'm going to do something," then they die. Then you you see them physically die and then they're resurrected, you would probably question that too. I know I would. I would have a really hard time with this. So before you get really down on these guys, remember uh, that that's just kind of how we would be. For three years, you've walked with Jesus, watched him heal. You've watched him, you've watched him prophesy. You've watched uh, and experienced things that you could hardly explain yourself. You've watched him turn water into wine. You, you've personally seen the miracles performed, and you're standing there. And, and when Christ gave up his spirit, he said this, it is finished. And you've been a part of that. And now, standing before you is the risen Lord. I'm, I'm certain that there are faithful followers in this church now that would probably doubt. You say, what's my point? Church, if we're going to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we must spend time getting to know Him through His Word. We must be diligent and devote our time wisely before His return. Remember, that's, that's how this series started out. That was the charge that was put forward. We started out with the importance of devoting. We started out with the importance of, of a commitment, of committing, right? We started out with the understanding that one day all of this that's before us is going to be laid bare when the Lord returns. And, and, and when we do, we want to know Him. Listen, these guys walked and talked with Christ. They ate and slept with Christ. They joked. They struggled. They did life with Him. And even after their time together in close fellowship, even after holding conversation and visibly seeing Jesus Christ, the text says, look at verse 17, they saw Him, they worshipped Him, but some doubted. You know, I'm not one to drift off the text when I'm preaching, but we should consider other areas of the Bible in order to, to gain some kind of perspective. That said, I feel it's necessary to consider... Uh, as we discuss the second advent of Christ, just a, just a few chapters prior to closing the book of Matthew, the Bible records Jesus sitting among his disciples on the Mount of Olives. Remember the, the Mount of Olives conversation? Remember that? He's, he's gathered his group of men, right? He's gathered the disciples. They're, they're overlooking Jerusalem, and he's teaching them. And he's, he's discipling them as they're going through this. As, as Jesus' uh, earthly ministry accounts for, he is discipling the disciples along the way as they're gathering, growing, and going. See what I did there? Okay, just make sure you're with me. He's teaching them, he's discipling them in the ways of how, don't miss this, they might continue after he's gone. And as his disciples meet with him privately and ask questions about the destruction of the temple and the fulfillment of the prophecies, namely the second coming, Jesus, Jesus says this, pay attention, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. He also continues, for false prophets, excuse me, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and great wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. That's a, that's a warning. Speaking of the future, when Christ will return, speaking of a time when, when, when men will be in a field and one will be taken, the other one left. Speaking of a time when, when two women will be grinding a handmill and one will be taken, the other one left. Speaking of a, a day and an hour that is unknown, what kind of people ought we be, church? That was my message last week. What kind of people ought we be? Should we be diligent in our faith or should we be reclined in our faith? What's my point? Church, Will you be able to recognize the Lord if He came back this very hour? 
These guys walked and talked and ate and drank, and they still doubted. So how do you prepare? How do you plan for the Lord's second coming, church? What are you thinking about that this week? Are you being diligent in your studies? Are you being diligent with your commitment, with your devotion to, to getting to know Jesus better? Let me offer this up for your consideration. This is why we gather as the church in order to study the Word of God. When we do, we grow in our faith. And when we, we grow in our understanding, and when we grow in our knowledge and grace, is so that we can go. You say, go where? We'll get to that. Let me just build my argument. Now that we've seen what helps with our doubts in our Christian walk, let's take a look at what, what gives Jesus all authority over creation, shall we? Main point two, the gospel of Jesus Christ gives him all authority. The gospel of Jesus Christ gives him all authority. The Bible says in verse 18, when Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. You know, it reminds me of a, a time when I was younger. Okay, Many of you were younger, like, like myself, right? And I remember getting up watching cartoons. Cartoons are like our thing. Remember Saturday morning cartoons? The best. I don't know about the cartoons today, man. I've checked them out, and I'm just like, mm, not the same, right? Especially if you're Gen X. I'm Gen X. And I remember getting up in the morning. I remember turning on Saturday morning cartoons and turning on the TV and staying glued for hours on these characters, right? I remember G.I. Joe, right? G.I. Joe was a real American hero for me. And, and, and I remember Scooby-Doo, and I remember Garfield, right? Garfield was, was hilarious. And Transformers, where are my Transformer people in here, right? And one of my favorites, Thundercats, right? Thunder, thunder, Thundercats. Oh! Some of my favorites. But you see, I, I had an all-time favorite. My all-time favorite was He-Man, right? He-Man was, was a superhero, master of the universe. He was characterized by the superhuman strength and ability. And he and his buddies would do battle against the evil forces of Skeletor, right? And, and, and in one note, he had this tiger named Cringer who would be transformed into this mighty battle cat. As soon as He-Man drew his sword, he raised it in the air, and he said, By the power of Grayskull, I have the power. Come on, you can do better than that. I have the power. power. Right. Exactly. And I can't, I can't help but think that he, man, when I read this statement about Jesus, when Jesus says that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, knowing as being the beginning of this great commission, Matthew stresses the authority of Jesus Christ, the same way the authority that can be transformed into power. The statement is the crescendo of Matthew's argument. Jesus had the power. He has the authority. His authority is, is not like anything else. He has the authority in his teaching. That's Matthew 7, 29. Jesus displayed authority in his healing. That's Matthew 8, 1 through 13. Jesus exercises authority in forgiving of sins. That's Matthew 9, 6. And what's more, he had authority over Satan and he has delegated the exact same authority to his apostles. That's Matthew 10, verse 1. Jesus has all the power and all the authority. And as we, as we take a close look at this gospel, Matthew helps us understand that Jesus has authority in heaven and on earth. That wasn't partial authority. That's not shared authority when you, you need to take some authority back to then have full authority. No, this was, this was all authority, both on heaven and earth, and don't miss this. And the right to do with it whenever, whenever, whatever. Whenever he wants to do it. Whatever he wants to do. It's, it's up to him. And what's my point? That God is in control. That Christ is is in control. If you have authority like that, and you can speak like that, then all control has been given to you. And that's Matthew's point. It's what he's trying to drive home. And I wonder why he said that. You ever read your passage, read this passage in particular, and pause? You ever, have you ever taken time to consider why this statement? It, it's been my experience that when, when a statement like this has been made, it tends to carry a tremendous amount of purpose it's, it's a reminder, church. You, you want to know something else? It, it, it's, it's statements like this that, that the Lord, uh, this is the way the Lord communicates. He tells you who he is. He tells you what he's done. You ever notice that he, he, he recalls our focus uh, to seize our attention? Let me tell you who I am and what authority I am, am, am saying this. 
And he wants to make sure that he's being crystal clear when he's doing this to us. And I've said it before, it's like, remember hearing your mom or dad when they wanted to get your attention. Remember that? What would they say? This is your mother speaking. This is your father speaking. Right? That would snap us into attention. Immediately our attention would, would go to them. And it's usually followed with something important that they, they want our attention because they're about to say something transformational. Something that is important to us. And he grabs his reader's attention, Matthew does. When he says this, Jesus said to them, All authority has been given to me on earth and in heaven. And I have the power, not just on earth, but, but also in heaven. Basically saying, listen up. Why do I bring this up? Jesus, since Jesus Christ has been given all authority, we may obey him without fear. And I know that sounds hard to grasp. I know that that's, sometimes that's hard to take in. But don't miss this. No matter where he leads us, no matter what circumstances we face, he is in control of your lives. And that's what all authority means. And that's what I have the power means. Listen, this is so important for us to know. It's, be, it's because of, and don't miss this, it's because of Christ's death. It's because of his burial and his resurrection that Jesus Christ defeated all enemies and won for himself all authority. You say, why am I telling you this? Why does Matthew want us to know all this authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus? The answer to that question can be found in our homiletical proposition today. And now that we've seen how Jesus' authority is over all creation, let's close with our homiletical proposition. Main point three. If you've been sleeping, wake up. <laughs> See, eyes get heavy sometimes in here. This is the end of this series. This is the crescendo of this message, if you will. And this is of utmost importance to take in. Go make disciples. Go make disciples, main point three. The Bible says in verse 19, Therefore go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Words have meanings. And the message of a word has a function. Go and make are imperatives, church. Imperatives are, are adjectives that suggest that the communicator is expressing something pressing. And what might be pressing, what might be urgent, what might be so important that makes this closing section of our text today stand out? Two words. Make disciples. It's not go. It's make disciples. Jesus is... is giving the 11 disciples a commandment to do something just after he shared who he is and by what power, by what authority that he holds to command them to carry out this mission. The Bible says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, translation, because of, go make disciples of all nations. This church is the activity. This church is the, not only a commandment, in the, this is the only commandment. This is the only commandment in the Great Commission. That's the, it's a commandment. It's not a suggestion. To make disciples. This church is the mission of the disciples. This church is the mission of Community Christian Fellowship. And Matthew was recording the words of Jesus. And, and, and while you're going, right, while, while you go, make disciples. That's his point. Let me help you with this. There is a passing off, okay, of responsibility that's unfolding before the reader's eyes as we bear witness to pass this responsibility to teach, this responsibility to grow, this responsibility to make disciples from Jesus to the next generation. I don't want you to miss that, church. There's a handing off. It's I was doing this, right? Book of Matthew, think. Use your head. Book of Matthew, I, the whole way through, he's teaching the disciples, I want you to be like this, and then he models it. Okay, then, there's, then there is the, the miracles, right? He does the miracles to prove who he is. And then he shows them how to do this and how to do it. And then at some point in the book, he says, okay, now I'm going to hand you the mantle, and now you have to take it. 
as you bear witness to the passing of responsibility to teach, this responsibility to grow, this responsibility to make disciples from Jesus to the next generation, that these band of 11 were to go out to all nations and to make, make an example, to do what? To, to make disciples, that they would help shape generations and then they would help shape the next generation and then the next generation. How? How, how are they supposed to do this? Hang on, we're almost there. The, the, the Bible doesn't leave us hanging because Jesus says this, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Folks, hear me say this. A disciple is one who has believed in Jesus Christ and has expressed their faith by being baptized into the faith. And that person, the one who's been baptized into the faith, remains, don't miss this, in the fellowship of believers that they might be taught the truths of the faith. And that's why you come to church, to learn about the truths, what is true. In other words, a disciple is able to go out and help win others, to teach them. This community Christian fellowship has been and continues today to be the pattern of the New Testament church, and it is our mission in this place, in this church. But unfortunately, we've lost sight of this mission. Churches have moved away from this as they've used this passage as a go-to passage. It's almost like a bumper sticker. And it infuriates me when I go to see people that, that talk about gather, grow, and go. And I'm going to use the Matthew 28 version of, and, I'm, I, and yes, I am making fun. We can talk later. But it, it really bothers me because I'm going, dude, are you going to do it or are you just going to say it? I don't want us to be that church that just, just says it. I want us to do it. And if that's not convicting enough, I want, you, I want you to listen very carefully to one of my favorite theologians, one of my favorite pastors, one of, one of an accomplished author. Dr. Warren Worsby says this, in many respects, we have departed from this pattern. That's the pattern I just described. In most churches, the congregation pays the pastor to preach, win the lost, and build up the saved, while the church members function as cheerleaders, if they are enthusiastic, or spectators. The converts are, one, baptized and given the right hand of fellowship. Then they join the other spectators. How much faster our churches would grow and how much stronger and happier our church members would be if each one discipling another believer. The only way a local church can be fruitful and multiply instead of growing in additions is with a systematic discipleship program. This is the responsibility of every believer and not just a small group who have been called to go, end quote. Oh, it gets worse. Don't worry. I got some more for you, but I love you. Folks, we have work to do. All of us have work to do. We can't do it by ourselves. This, this is going to require each member of this church helping to get us back to what we're commanded to do, to gather to grow, to go. And if not, let me offer this for a suggestion, then maybe we need to rethink our mission statement. Folks, hear me say this. This is why I felt it necessary to revisit the mission of Community Christian Fellowship. This is why I felt necessary to, to recast vision. This is, this is why I felt it necessary to write this series. This is why I felt it necessary to remind us of our calling. How on earth do we expect to live up to this calling if we, if we don't gather how on earth do we expect to live up to this calling if we don't grow? Let me tell you something. I can tell you that when we get, si we get serious about this, when we decide to get real serious about this as a church, this is what Jesus says. And you can bank on this. Verse 19 and 20 says, And surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Listen, brothers and sisters. Jesus is not just in the midst when his people gather. He's also present with them as they scatter into the world and witness. When they take that good news and they take it outside these doors and share it with the rest of the world. And let us be a church that lives out this calling to gather the saints, to, to grow with the saints so that we might go and deliver the good news to some future saints. Just as we've been called to do. Because you see, knowing the Lord will help 
with our doubts. In the gospel, Jesus Christ gives him all authority. And because that's the case, our calling is to go make disciples. And some of you may want to know or are asking yourselves right now how serious I am about this. How are we to understand the mission of this church? Let us, let us consider for just a moment, Community Christian Fellowship, the words of Oswald J. Smith. He writes this, and I quote, Any church that is not seriously involved in helping fulfill the Great Commission has forfeited its biblical right to exist. End quote. I don't want to end on a, on a negative note, but I definitely want you to consider that this week. And I want you to consider that as you move through the week and as we have opportunities for you to come gather, to come grow, and to, come, and to go. Some of you are doing that. Others of you probably can't get there. Well, if you can't, just let us know how we can help you do that, how we can help you grow. Because it is my desire in this church that I see every Christian grow. And we are in the process as we speak of creating a discipleship program for this church for that very reason. Because I'm taking these words literally and seriously, and I hope that you do the same. And so, Father, I thank you for this opportunity, and I thank you for this time to speak to your people. Lord, this series has been a challenging one at that, but a necessary one, one that I have felt extremely convicted over as I've taken time to, to study over your scripture and to seek understanding of how to apply that with love. And I know that sometimes, Lord, speaking truth in love may seem like it's negative and seem like it's supposed to be stinging, but the truth of it all is, you know, you, you, love, you correct the ones that you love, Lord. And, and I know this firsthand in my life, that there are times in my life where, where I get out of line, that you lovingly bring me back into the fold, lovingly put me back on that path. And yes, sometimes it, it does hurt a little bit to hear truth. It comes from a place of undesirable love, Lord. Like, you, you are just incredible in what you're doing in this place and these people, and, and I'm just blessed to be here and to be able to shepherd these people into the next season. And so, Father, thank you for that opportunity. I pray that this message today be written on the tablet of our hearts, that, that those that you have allowed me to shepherd, that they leave this place thinking about what was said today and apply that word in their daily walk. And so, Father, I lift up this congregation and this message to you, and it's because of your Son, Jesus Christ, I'm able to do all of this. And I give you the glory, Lord. Amen. We are going to open up the altar. If you would like prayer, we have a prayer team that's standing by that would love to pray with you. Um, but just in case you want something a little more private, just before you leave the door, uh, just before you exit the, the sanctuary, just to the right, there's pens and there's forms that you can fill out. If you want that to be something private, just fill it out, put your name, seal it, drop it in the box there. The offering box is right there, so you put it in there, we'll get it. And the elders, the staff, we'll be praying for you um, throughout the week. We get some every week. Uh, and some of you guys have got some serious challenges. And I want you to know that we're here for you every single day praying for you praying for you by name and praying for you by, by circumstance. So everything that you guys go through, we, we love to be a part of that. So thank you. All throughout the Bible, we see lots of different stories of people receiving healing from Jesus. You see the woman at the well who doesn't necessarily receive healing, but she's seen by Jesus. We see lots of other people who are made whole, who are made clean. And the first thing they do is they go out and they share all the things that Jesus has done in their life, how they were seen, how they were healed, how he moved in their life. Those are the same things, that same bits of evidence that we need to share with others in our lives. But then don't leave those people there changed. As Nate said, we need to continue to walk with those people and disciple them in their new walk with Christ. throughout my 
history Your faithfulness has walked beside me The winter storms made way for spring In every season from where I'm standing I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life all over my life I see your promises in fulfillment all over Good morning. Um, I'm uh, up here to tell you about two of the ministries that our church is involved in. The first one is the food bank ministry. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Some of these good works include providing food for the Fauquier County Food Bank. They are currently asking for tuna, and peanut butter, smooth or crunchy. There's a table in the back where you can leave your donations. Tommy Thompson has volunteered to take the food to the food bank. Matthew 10, 8 says, 
freely you have received, freely give. And then in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 9, we read, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness remains forever. And that is Psalm 112, verse 9. If you're like me, I forget very easily, so I have to make a special effort to remember by making a grocery list. So let's all bring peanut butter and tuna next week. The second ministry I want to tell you about is what I call the Mary ministry, not Mary Hall. Uh, Luke 10, 38 through 39 says, Now it happened as they went that he, and I inserted Jesus, entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. Every Wednesday morning at 10, we symbolically sit at Jesus' feet as we study his word. We are currently in Galatians, and then we will go on to Ephesians and on through the rest of the New Testament. Tommy Thompson leads this study. We spend time sharing with each other how God is working in our lives. We have a time of prayer, and also, since most of us are old school, we sing the old hymns, such as, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. I love to tell the story of Jesus and his love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. How great thou art, how great thou art. Well, you don't have to be an oldie to be a part of this ministry. You don't even have to be able to sing. You just need a desire to sit at Jesus' feet. So everyone is welcome. So see you Wednesday. However, there is no child care. So y'all come out on Wednesday morning. Thank you. Good morning. I'm not going to sing us out in prayer. <laughs> and I'm not going to use Brandon as an example. <laughs> if we can bow our heads, please. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this service. I want to thank you for this church family as we gather, grow. And I pray, Lord, that this week that we focus, Lord, on being disciples and focus on what does that look like, Lord? What does that look like individually for each one of us, Lord? And that we focus on serving. And what does that look like? And Jesus called us, Lord, to put him first. And I pray, Lord, that we will put you first this week as we go. And that we will be in your word, Lord. And that we will share our faith and we will share our love as you have called us to do. I pray that you will bless our week with your presence. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.